Okay. The person that you chose had the better bucket. So I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and she's like, oh yeah, my mother, you know, is a good person. She's selfless. And I personally don't believe in the word selfless. I've got two theories. You're either self or you're selfish. Self is when you're giving to yourself, meeting your needs and meeting the other person's needs. Selfish is when you're taking away from yourself and taking away from the other person. Selfless in my book doesn't exist. I, I, if someone has reached that, like Buddha and Jesus, it's so far beyond our notion that I don't even think that that exists. But she says to me, oh, my mother was selfless. I said, that's an interesting choice of words. She's like, well, the other alternative was my father, who was a selfish bastard. Selfless and selfish are the same. One is overt, one is covert. So you could strip it down and really get down and dirty with your parents and your buckets, or you can just take my word for it. That's the way it is. When two people get together and you think you're so different than your partner, you are not. You're getting together on a shared value, on a thread to work through something. That's why I'm not saying every relationship has to last forever, but it can because I have a theory and we renegotiate every seven years and you can renegotiate those threads. Okay. When I ask a client, <coughs> what, how did you meet? And what was your first fight? Tells me, how did they meet the innocence, the shared value, the thread? And what was your fight, first fight? Tells me how the egg got cracked. The crack in the egg. Every single one of us has a crack in the system. Okay? And if we figure that out, we have the whole story of the couple in front of us. We can help them reach a point of renegotiation, crack the foundation of how they met, rebuild on a new shared value, a new thread make, and keep going. That's the beauty of long-term relationships that you get to do this over and over and over again. In this day and age, most people are not doing the work together. They're, they're just checking out. They decide to leave. So we're getting different, you know, sort of views of, of this. But that would be the long-term marriage use, usefulness of a model like this would be to see that play out. That would be amazing research. But whatever. So you decide <laughs> as a little kid, dad has the power because he has the money. I don't know. He's the one who beats my mother. He's the one who gets to go drinking and come home late. He gets to, to, to watch sports on TV. doesn't matter. Mom has the power because she gets to shop and do whatever she wants and pretends that, that, you know, that she's not getting anything and she's a victim and dad's calling the shots. Like in that big, big fat Greek wedding, when the woman says to the daughter, your father's the head, but I'm the neck. Are you the head or are you the neck? That's another way to, to, to say over or covert. Which one are you? Which one do you like to be? Which one in your relationship of your parents did you observe that you thought had more power? There's no wrong or right answer. It's just so you know who you have the alliance with. Whoever you have the alliance with is at the tip, is at the bottom of the triangle. So my alliance is with my father. That means that my mother is at the tip. Okay, and this is going to come into play <coughs> a few times. So write that on your paper, and you can always change it, but just so you could go through the model, who do you have the alliance with? Is it your mother or your father? My dad had more overt sort of power. I obviously like that, and I chose to follow in his footsteps and, and live in my relationships that way that haven't served me much, but I identified it. Okay. So you first have to identify who is the wrong alliance with. Then at the tip of the triangle is the other parent. The importance of this, and it goes back to the first book, when you know that you have, in my case, the mother at the tip of the triangle, and we'll get to that as the, as the mistress in a minute, that is the parent's qualities from their bad bucket that you need to integrate into your whole life, into your life to become whole. So I'm in that process right now, and I've told you about my Band-Aid. A, awareness, I, integration, D, do it differently. 
It's the Band-Aid approach in order to get whole, to heal the wound, or as much healing is done, the scarifying the wound. Okay? So I now have gone back to the buckets and looked at all the stuff that I put in my mother's bad buckets, and I am picking it apart and saying, oh, I need this. Oh, I need to do this. Oh, this is a good thing. So you come with a different perception about what's good and bad. Because good and bad is relative. There's no real good and bad. I always say there's universal truths and then there's value statements. Very few universal truths. Very few. Everything else is just a value statement. And I told you a few weeks ago that you have to pick a stance. You have to pick a side. Okay? We are required. Even if it's quote unquote wrong, you have to stand for something. You have to pick something. You can change it later on. But you've got to know what you stand for. And part of the integration process of healing the subconscious is understanding that you might have chosen the wrong alliance. And now you're saying, wait a minute, maybe my mother in my case does have something to offer me. And I'm going to integrate that bucket. And that's the process I'm in now. So I had to go through a whole five year stint with cancer, figure all this stuff out to now say, hmm. Maybe I shouldn't have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Maybe my mother's bucket does have some wisdom. And I can tell you that both your parents, if you believe you chose them, great. If you believe that that's just who you got, great. Have something to teach you. Have some wisdom to impart on you. Even if you're adopted, even if they mistreated you. There is wisdom in those buckets. Because if your mind is them, you better understand your mind. And the only way you're going to understand that is by populating those buckets and identifying that you are them. And rather than shunning the shadow and hating yourself for being them, the parts that you don't like of them, you need to integrate those so that you could become a whole person, which goes back to the original Peroscamos mystical marriage. You've got to achieve self. You've got to achieve a, a place of home within and that only comes from unifying those buckets that mom and dad gave you. So you go back, you realize that your mother's on the tip of the triangle, and what did your mother show you in the bad buckets that you've discarded as part of your shadow, as part of the part of you that's discarded that you don't like about yourself, bring it in, integrate it into your life, and now you can work from a place of wholeness. And hopefully the do it different, the D part of the Band-Aid, is what you do in your relationship. And hopefully you don't repeat a Zeus and Hera, which most people do, but you do it differently. And you find a healthy way to live in relationship. That usually isn't the case. It's usually through the relationship, if you stick it out long enough, that you'll get to this point. Does everyone understand wrong alliance and how important it is for your subconscious, for your growth, for your sense of self, your identity, and what you're bringing to the relationship. You are bringing this triangle into the relationship. Yes. So you have to identify that first. Okay. Now let me take you back to why Hephaestus and Aries are so important. And you have Hephaestus, an innocence, and Aries, a war and a conflict going on within you. So there's a little Native American story I love to share, and I, I, I talk about this with my daughter all the time, and I'm sure I've told you this before, where a grandfather is talking to his grandson, and he says, son, there's two wolves living inside of you, a dark wolf and a light wolf. And the grandson says to his grandfather, and which one wins? And the grandfather says, it depends which one you feed, okay? Most people want to feed their light wolf. We cannot negate the dark wolf, the shadow, the bad buckets like I call this. This is, this is a, a quick story to explain that we all have a dark side, we all have a shadow, we discard the sad shadow. The reality is we have to feed both of them. We really do. And that's why Hephaestus and Aries come into play. Hephaestus was discarded, he was deformed, he was thrown out of Olympus. 
during your zero to seven, and I say zero to seven because that's when your personality is developing, those seven years where you're kind of taking on the story, something about you was told was wrong. Okay? <laughs> Every single one of us has this. You had a brother that was born, dethroned you. Your father died and you had to assume to be father of the house and you can't do it as well as your father because you're a six-year-old kid. Your mother told you that girls shouldn't shave their legs, but you shaved your legs behind her back and you were rep reprimanded. You have some story that got you kicked out of Olympus. Olympus is the heaven that you see as your mom and dad. Again, metaphorically mom and dad. I'm not talking literally. If you happen to be lucky, have mom and dad in the home, great. If not, don't get stuck on that, okay? So from this Olympus, Part of you, a part of you was discarded, was kicked out. Girls should be <clears throat> innocent and calm and quiet. Children should be heard, uh, seen, not heard. You get more flies with honey, whatever bullshit your parents told you. That you should be, that you are not, it's basically discarded you. And you at that moment decided that you were imperfect. You at that moment decided you were not enough. You at that moment decided you were the black sheep of the family. Newsflash, even those of you that are not the black sheep, obvious, even you that are like the pre preferred child, have something that was wrong. You're the preferred child because you never acted on that. So you lived up to the expectation of mom and dad, the best student, even though you wanted to throw your school books in the river. That, if you flip that around, that perfect, that, you know, preferred child, because Aries was the preferred child, but we're talking about Hephaestus, and you turn it around, that was what your real wish was. You just didn't act on it. Some of us acted on it as the black sheep. Others of those didn't and <laughs> stayed in, in the glory, but your thought was, ooh, I want to do that bad thing. You didn't do it so you wouldn't be kicked out of Olympus, but your thought around it already kicked you out, showed you you were imperfect. Every single person has this, okay? This is why I say the cracking of the egg. The relationship will explain to you what the relationship doesn't have that's perfect. The first fight will tell you everything about that soft spot, that weak spot. I normally ask clients, what happened between zero to seven? In the astrology chart, you could see it with Saturn. It's very easy. But you yourself might know what happened that zero to seven. What was it about you that was wrong? In my story, I was a girl and not a boy. My mother wanted the boy. She had already had the boy. And my mother didn't want any more children Asked the doctor to tie her tubes. He said, no, I slipped in, and lo and behold, someone was born she didn't want. Remember, this is my story. I mean, it's true. But your story is true because this is how you're living your life. And I was a, bo a girl, not a boy. So what do you think I did to solve that problem? I don't want to be seen. I, I'm very loud, and I obviously overcompensate it with my voice and, 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 and you know, whatever I do. But I, I, I don't wear makeup, I don't wear flashy clothes, I'm very demure in that sort of thing. And I took on the role of, in my case, dad, the man. Because if she wanted a boy and a non-existent child, long before I was going to give it to her. So when you can identify how you were kicked out of Olympus, your hostos, you're going to understand why you're with your chosen partner. Because that partner is also with that same story. It could be the whole flip side. I married the God, the guy on the pedestal. His parents, to this day, kiss his ass. I married the opposite side of the coin. I'm thrown out of Olympus. He is God. He is Zeus. So don't get caught up on, oh, she's crazy. I'm, I'm with someone who's the opposite story. The opposite is the same. Take out a coin from your purse. There's a heads and a tails, but there's only one coin. When you do it differently, then we're in a whole other paradigm, a whole other story. If not, you're still living out your parent's story, which then becomes yours.
And the point of enlightenment, the point of spiritual growth, the point of the mystical marriage to then do it differently is so that we don't continue transgenerational trauma and patterns, the sins of the father, as the Bible says. That's the goal. Is this clear so far? Okay. So something you have to understand, and I'm going to talk about the mistress in a minute. You were kicked out of Olympus in your own head. Maybe you were literally kicked out of your house. Maybe your parents died. Maybe they gave you up for adoption. Maybe your story is very literal. But this is figurative, metaphorical. You were kicked out of Olympus in your own head for having a flaw, or for those of you who weren't the black sheep and stayed on Olympus, you didn't act on the flaw that you want to act on, but you were in your own head ruined already, damaged, like a dose, and you extricate yourself. At this moment, you realize you need to leave home, you don't fit into this family, you're the black sheep, whatever your story is. This is going to be satisfied, and this is super important, in your sex life. Okay? Sex, fantasy, addiction, whether it's workaholic, whether it's gambling, whether it's drugs, I don't care how you get fantasy in your life. Part of the relationship that you have with your partner, I'm going to call it sex for a minute, is to reclaim innocence. Innocence is another word for fantasy. So I had a client the other day, and I said, what's going on? My husband's addicted to pornography. And we, I think we talked about this the other day at lunch. And he loves video games. So when I open the energy, I see that that's his fantasy. And her fantasy, and I see this, she puts her baby down to bed. She stays with the baby. If my theory from the first book is right, our children meet our needs. So her baby meets the need of her to keep occupied and, and be needed. And there's a little fantasy in being a mom and the baby and all that. And she thinks about her ex-boyfriend. So she satisfies fantasy by thinking about her ex-boyfriend. Okay? So he has porn and he has video games. She's got her daughter and she's got her ex. They are both satisfying the innocence, healing that they were kicked out of Olympus. We must go back into the snow globe. First book, first chapter of my book is Shattering the Snow Globe of Delusion. We are all deluded that our family unit was healthy and happy. Those that come to me that speak about how idyllic and happy their childhood are, are even more screwed up than those of us that realize that our childhood was not idyllic because we've already found the fissure. You as a therapist might have to help your client find that crack crack it open, and then you help them put that snow globe back together. I've talked about that. But this is what I refer to as the snow globe. Every snow globe has a crack. Every child's innocence is lost. This is considered the rape of Persephone that I have here in the mystical marriage poster. Okay? Your rape. It's a very harsh word, but whatever that was for you, that you were thrown out of Olympus you must reclaim your innocence. There are actual practices where women go and put the hymen back. They tighten their vaginas. This exists in the real world. This is another way of capturing your innocence. Innocence, and if you remember when we did addiction psychology a few months ago, I told you that we've now identified in, addic in addiction research that the parts of the brain related to addiction, it, whether it's food, whether it's drugs, whether it's sexuality, whether it's video games, all of that is the same part of the brain. And we now have science to back up what we've known metaphorically and spiritually all these years. Innocence, regaining that. In my second marriage, we regained our innocence by being addicted, more innocent than this, you can't make this shit up, Hallmark movies. We were addicted to Hallmark movies. That's what we would do. We would watch Hallmark movies all weekend. 
I mean, that's so Piscean, and I'm a Pisces. Every single one of us wants to re-enter the snow globe. Astrologically, if you know where your Neptune is, that's what you're trying to, to regain, is that innocence. So all addictions, any form of fantasy, whether it's Dungeons and Dragons, or drinking, or sex, or bondage, shoe obsessions, is you trying to reclaim your innocence, okay? That is going to be the mistress in your relationship. And I go back to tell you that every relationship has a mistress because every single person is born of three. Every single one of us comes from a Therefore, we must be triangulated in our relationship. So write down what you think your mistress might be. My mistress right now is the alarm clock. My boyfriend has to get up at the freaking crack of dawn. I've named her Hera, and we laugh. I'm like, oh, there's Hera, the alarm clock, because he's got to get to work. That's going to be useful for us in a minute. Your mistress is going to tell you something about your subconscious that you need to heal, repair, integrate, whatever word you want to use. Every relationship has a mistress. It may show up as someone in fidelity, as a real male or female that shows up in your cup, in your relationship. It may show up as a third person in your bedroom, if you're into that. It may show up like this couple as porn, or the child, or the ex-boyfriend fantasy thoughts. I don't care. I am not the type of therapist that is thrown off by those things. Someone reaches out and says, my husband cheated. So what? Let's work it through. We have a model. There's a reason that we've created. If you believe in that theory, work with me for a moment. Let's just assume we create everything. That you created that mistress in your life. Being another woman, being an addiction for some reason. Part of that reason is to regain your innocence. But the subconscious does not know how. How do you get back into Olympus? How do you gain the favor of your mother who threw you out because you have a club foot and you're ugly? And she opted for the favorite son who was brawny and gorgeous. In mythology, there's a wonderful story. So perfect. Aphrodite goddess of love and beauty you've all seen